Okay, good afternoon everyone. Lovely to see you all here. Uh, first, I would like to thank Ian, I think he's here somewhere. There he is, uh, for inviting me and the other organizers. Oops, sorry. Is it on? Is it on? Yes. I'm, I'm loud enough anyway, I'm sure I'm not done without it. Yeah. Um, I'm one of the Glass Girls. Um, so if you, if you know the story, can you put your hand up? Not sure why I'm here. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm glad you did. Thank you. Um, before I tell you how I became a Glasgow girl, um, I'll tell you a bit about how I came to the UK. Um, so in the year 2000, um, we are originally from Somalia um, and the civil war in Somalia, so it was really dangerous to stay there. Um, it was getting really difficult. Um, to, to lead a normal life. Uh, I'm sure if you know anything about um, you know, the country itself, you'll know about all the, all the issues um, and the conflict that's ongoing. So my mom decided that I actually wasn't safe enough to stay there anymore and for a better future for me, um, it's better for us to leave. But unfortunately, we didn't have enough money for my dad to come with us. So it was just me and my mom and she was pregnant with my little sister at that time. So we left um, in the year 2000 and then went to uh, Kenya. We stayed in Kenya for three months. Um, to get the paperwork sorted um, before we left uh, the continent. And then we arrived in London and um, we lived in Yan London for a year and a half. At that time we were living with a group of friends. Um, so when my sister was born, um, it got too crowded for us to all live there. So my mom approached the home office and said to the home office, look, we need our own accommodation. It's getting really too crowded for us here. Um, so we need, we need our own place. And they said, that's fine, we'll, we'll give you your own accommodation, but we don't house asylum seekers in Glasgow anymore, uh, sorry, in London anymore. And we thought, that's fine, 10 minutes away, 20 minutes away, you know, it shouldn't be a bother. It's fine, it's completely fine. But of course, that wasn't the case. So three weeks later, we were staying in a temporary accommodation, and it came with a massive coach. And this coach had lots of families in it. And I said that we actually did a tour of the UK that day because we were literally like going from each city to the other. Um, so we went to like Liverpool, um, uh, Manchester, uh, all these places. So of course everyone's getting off, right? But we're not getting off. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? Are my family even on this list, right? So I went up to the guy and I was like, excuse me, sir, are my family on the list? Because everyone's getting off, but we're not getting off. And he said, yeah, it, it's on the list. You're last. And we thought, why are we last? And they're like, you're going to Glasgow? Yeah. And I was like, what? And he's like, Glasgow? And I was like, yeah, where is Glasgow? And he's like, uh, it's in Scotland. And I was like, oh my God, where's Scotland? <laughs> I've never heard of Scotland before, let alone Glasgow, right? So I went and sat back down. I'm like, mom, do you know where Glasgow is? She's like, no. And I was like, do you know where Scotland is? She's like, no. And I thought, oh my goodness, where are we going? But then one of the other families who was getting off at Newcastle or something, she had overheard this. And she said, Amal, I feel so sorry for you. <laughs> Why? And she said, I heard you're going to Glasgow. And I was like, yeah, and? And she said, do you know, have you never heard about Glasgow? It's snowing all the time. Everyone's really, you know, not nice and everything. And I thought, oh my goodness, thanks very much. Uh, so I burst into tears. Um, and now I say, actually, I would love to see that family again and tell them how wrong they are. I absolutely love Glasgow for so many reasons. And you know, Glasgow's <coughs> motto is, um, you know, people make Glasgow. But I think actually people make every city that they're in. Um, and it's the people who make the place, basically. So, I arrived in Glasgow and we lived in high-rise flats in Scotston, which are sadly demolished now. Um, and then I started the notorious drum Truffle High School, uh, which had a really bad reputation at that time. And uh, there were a lot of issues, there was a lot of racism, because when asylum seekers were dispersed to Glasgow, um, it was actually in the year 2000, the, the year we came, uh, but we arrived in Glasgow in 2001, the communities were not prepared, the schools were not prepared, the council were not prepared, the public were not prepared. People didn't know why asylum seekers were here. You know, there, just, there was a lot of ignorance um, to the extent that actually one of my friends uh, from Algeria, he was uh, stabbed and he almost died um, trying to stop a fight. So there was a police outside our school the whole time. In the year 2004, um, I was 14 and we had, uh, well, we'd received our news. Um, Mr. Garvin, legend, my hero, he came, uh, but he wasn't my hero at that time, he was my hero after that. Um, I'll tell you why later, but basically he came to, and we were, I was in a PE, in PE class, and he came up to me and he's like, Amal, your mum's on the phone, and I thought, oh my goodness, something's happened, something's gone wrong, and I was like, can you tell me, and I was trying to, I was trying to figure it out from his face, but he, he was just so good, I couldn't tell what was going on, but my heart was beating so much, 
So I went up to the class and picked up the phone and my mum basically said, we just got our leave to remain. And I burst into tears, Mr. Gerberman burst into tears. It was an amazing moment. But then I couldn't help but think, I know I can live in the UK. I know I can continue my life here. I know I can go to university. I can have a job. But I've got a group of friends who don't even know what's going to happen to them. So it was, it was really tough, but at the same time, I would, at the same time, I was trying to be positive. So I went back to my PE class, and then eventually, I didn't tell my friends straight away. It actually took me a couple of days to tell them. Um, so we continued living our teenage lives. And then the year 2005, in March, uh, something happened that's changed my life forever. It's actually made me who I am today. One of my friends, Agnesa, is a Roma gypsy. Um, she had been living in Glasgow for five years at that time. She had been dumb raided and detained and locked up um, for three weeks. She had done nothing wrong, right? She'd been living in Glasgow with her two brothers, younger brothers, and her mom and dad, right? And the thing is, asylum seekers don't come to, you know, there's the whole stereotype that they come here, oh, they come here and steal our jobs and our housing and all of that. Nobody, right, wants to leave their culture, their family, their weather for nothing. You have to be, I know, today's an exception though. Um, <laughs> But you know you have to be in a position where you really you, you need a you you're searching for a better future, especially for your children. Nobody goes through that for nothing, you know. And to be living in Glasgow for five years, to be integrated into the community, into life here, and to be snatched up like that for doing nothing wrong. The only thing they were is asylum seekers. They're still human beings, you know. Asylum uh, seeking asylum is a human right. Um, and. Basically what happened, on a Sunday morning, uh, I think it was 7 o'clock in the morning, 14 Home Office officials, wearing bulletproof vests, went to Agnesa's house, handcuffed her father in front of her two younger brothers, put them in detention-like vans, right, separated the family in two vans, and then drove them to Yalswood Detention Centre in England and, and locked them up for three weeks. And now, actually, whenever we come together, it's obviously it's been 10 years now since we started uh, the campaign, um, and every time we, we sit and talk, I hear Agnesa telling me something new, and, you know, last time she was telling us about when we were, they were in the vans, they had to stop at a petrol station so that they can, you know, top up the, the petrol and everything, and literally the guards opened the door, chucked food at them as if they were animals, and then, you know, closed the, the doors again, and when her little brother needed the toilet, they told him, well, you just have to do do your business in the van, right? This is the conditions people are being put through. So she got locked up in Yardsworth for three weeks now. Every detention center is, is a jail, literally, let's face it, is a jail. It's got barbed wire, electrical fencing. You know, it, it's absolutely disgraceful that a place like that actually exists in this day and age. And um, I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't understand why Ines, a child, is being treated like that. I mean, a British child would never be treated like that. So why is an asylum-seeking child being treated like that? I don't know, human beings. What is the difference? So I was absolutely outraged, and believe it or not, I was actually quite a shy girl before that, but you know, that all went down the drain, really. Um, and I remember marching to Mr. Garvin, and this is the point he, he became my hero. Mr. Garvin was a bilingual teacher at Drum Chapel, and um, he basically really, really supported us, and he really guided us, because he could have easily just said, you know what, just don't do it, just leave this, let this go, because I said to him, I was like, I'm not going back to any of my classes. I know I have my leave to remain. I know I can continue with my life here, but I am not going to sit down and do nothing when people like that are being treated like criminals. Absolutely disgraceful. And then that's when Jennifer Tony Lee and, um, and Rosa and Avelina and Emma came together and we all we became known as the Glass Girls. And then my face was on the news and newspaper. Um, and really, it was just about that. And then I think the main point for us was that we just wanted our friend back. And I think the media really liked that fact that actually we're not politicians, we had no agenda behind this, we literally just wanted our pal back, you know, and we knew this was wrong. And there's this whole stereotype that young people are not, are very disconnected with politics and everything like that, but actually we proved that wrong, I think. <laughs> Agnesa was released three weeks later, thank goodness. Um, she's a care worker now, her brothers are at college, and it's, it's fantastic. I still remember the day we heard the news that she was going to be released um, but I know that that experience will always remain with Ignesa. It will always remain with each person who's been locked up like that, especially children. And I say that because we lost one family. And with Zara and her uh, two boys, um, they were 13 and 5 at that time. They were downgraded and detained twice. Once was an accident. How can you play with people's lives like that? It came to the point that every time there was a knock on the door, they would hide under the table thinking it was the home office coming to get them. 
Now the mental health levels were on another, you know, on another level, literally. And um, I, I honestly believe <coughs> that the whole asylum system is designed to give a person mental health issues, even if they didn't have it to begin with. You know, it's absolutely disgraceful. Two weeks ago, um, we were outside Dungavel Detention Centre, it's the only detention centre in Scotland. Um, and I, I, I remember thinking, you know, with Margaret uh, from the Campaign to Welcome Refugees, um, who's an amazing, amazing person. Um, remember standing there thinking, 10 years we've been campaigning, and Margaret and everybody else have been campaigning way before us, and we're still here. There's still so much to do. People are still being locked up. I can't wait until all detentions are shut down because they're not a place for human beings, especially in the community. And actually, in the UK, it's actually the only place in Europe that has indefinite detention. You know, there's a woman speaking outside Dan Gable saying, when you're in jail, you're counting down to the days, right? You know when you're meant to get out. When you're in detention, you're counting up because you don't know when you're going to leave. They don't give you a time limit. You can stay there one, two, three, four years. It doesn't matter. You know, there used to be pregnant women, you know, being locked up like that. It's absolutely shocking. And on the 30th of May, there's going to be a national demonstration outside uh, Don Gable, and we're hoping that it's going to be uh, really, really big. And if you guys can make it, please do. I know some of you are not from Scotland, but if you're north of England, come and say hi. Um, and uh, because there's hunger strikes in the detention centres, and actually I found out recently that the leader of the hunger strikes in Don Gable has been deported. You know, they wanted to silence them, but they're not. And I know that, uh, I think it was last week or the week before, there was another demonstration outside Don Gable. Unfortunately, I couldn't go to it, but I know the people who went um, actually said that some of the, the, the kind of detainees came out in the yard. So there's literally a wall between the people outside and the people inside. And you know, people were shouting freedom from the outside and they were shouting freedom from the inside. And it was really important because I know that the people in detention, it, it was really important for them to know that they're not alone. And that there's people on the outside fighting for them. And that we're with them, you know, and we're with them in their struggle. Now, we're... This talk is meant to be about racism um, and, and you know anti-racism, and unfortunately, we I don't need to really go into it much. We see it. we see the rise of racism and fascism. It's absolutely disgusting. And the thing is, with racism, it's it's used as a powerful weapon, right? To to basically incite hatred and encourage fear. Um, you know, when it comes to like times of conflict and economic crisis, you know, Nigel Farage, oh. Oh, I'm part of Stand Up to UKIP because clearly I have not much else to do, you see. Um, and, and, and I just can't, I can't believe that man. I really can't. The, the, the fact that he's allowed to, you know, have a platform to share all of his opinions is disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. I don't know if you saw the leaders debate, right? You saw what he said about HIV. I work in the mental health world. I know how much stigma has an impact on people. And he literally just stigmatized everyone that has HIV. It's absolutely disgusting. And some of the other things he was saying, he was saying, um, actually, you know, uh, kids don't play in the streets anymore because of immigrants. Last time I checked, traffic lights were not immigrants. You know, so really, he needs to um, find other things to actually back it in. But coming back to, you know, having to blame immigrants for everything, the economic crisis, okay. Economic crisis is immigrants are not to blame for that. Bankers and those in power and the super rich are the worst to blame. <laughs> and I really think it's about time they are held accountable because, you know, blaming immigrants for everything. I mean, look at the NHS. The NHS would collapse without immigrants. And, you know, Nigel Farage is always talking about the open border and how many immigrants are coming in. Maybe we should have a conversation about actually how many British people leave the UK to work abroad for better conditions, better pay, tax-free. You know, I saw the statistics yesterday. There's about 2.2 million um, British people who leave the UK, you know, live in Spain, Portugal, Dubai, you know, and, uh, but here we have Nigel Farage. But they're not called immigrants, though. They're called expats. So that's quite interesting. Um, yeah, and you know, with, with Nigel Farage, he's, he's ridiculous. Like, he, he, if there's, there's anything he would want to blame, just blame it on immigrants. But that's, but that's the whole thing now about the media and politicians like him. They want people to focus on, you know, the vulnerable people, people who are kind of the, the minority. 
so that we don't actually, we don't focus our anger on people like him and people like the bankers and the people who actually deserve um, our anger. And also we see the rise of fascism, we see the rise of, you know, Pegida in Germany and other parts of, uh, you know, Europe. You see in France what's going on, um, I was a part of Stand Up to UKIP, I was invited to speak in Sheffield. And one of the other speakers was a woman who came from France. Her name is Ismahan Choder. She's amazing. She started like a kind of women's rights movement there, but also a, a movement against um, Islamophobia. And she was talking about what they're trying to do now. They're actually trying to stop women who wear headscarves to go to university. You know? I mean, I thought, I, I know we have it bad here, but to that extent, I don't think so. I, I've got faith in people here, at least I hope I do, that actually would not let that kind of fascism ever um, come to this country. You know, I hope we never do that, and I hope we always come together uh, in times where we need to stand up for what's right, and that's something I'm really, really proud of. As part of Unite Against Fascism, um, I, was in, uh, I was part of a delegation that went to Auschwitz um, in November, and it's one of the most horrific experiences ever, but definitely worth it. And if you haven't been, please go. Please, please go. Uh, we learned about the Holocaust in school. We learned about Anne Frank and, and, and you know, others, and how much you know what happened basically, but going to Auschwitz and Birkenau, seeing that level of atrocity that was committed by human beings to other human beings based on their religion or race was absolutely, oh my goodness, it really blew me away. And we were speechless, and you can imagine that doesn't happen very often, but we were, we really were. It was it's something that I, I look back and think, my goodness, but now also we think, we see it as well, we see the signs this could happen again. We see Islamophobia on the rise. You know, I'm, I'm absolutely like, it's so difficult being uh, a young Muslim uh, woman in the West. It really is. Absolutely see the amount of hatred that I see, you know, especially in the media. I mean, the things like Facebook and Twitter. We had, um, we, I helped organize the big anti-racism demo in Glasgow. And, you know, I put up a photo of me and Emma, one of the other Glasgow girls, holding a poster saying we support the demo. We had Nazis tweeting us. We literally had Nazis tweeting us. And then sometimes I hear people saying, oh no, racism and fascism, it doesn't exist. Mm. No, it does, unfortunately. It really does. And, and you know, it, it's, a, it's really heartbreaking. It really is because with, with Islamophobia, actually uh, the 2011 consensus says that Islam has been in the UK for over 300 years. But somehow now it's, you know, you see the, the Islamophobia. And I can't help but think Islamophobia is being used so that the government can go and attack countries for their own benefits. You know, it's nothing to do with this, but, but 2.2 billion Muslims. If we were all terrorists, I think we'd all be in trouble. You know, I really do. Honestly, it's, it's true. But it's just stupid that actually people think that. And I see, I see like the daily fail, like I like it to call it. You know, if, if somebody just gathered that for like, you know, a year, you'd see it. That, that's all they'll have you thinking. But we, we are, yes, it is a struggle. Anti-racism is an issue. Um, no, 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 anti-racism is not an issue. Racism is an issue, sorry. <laughs> um, and fascism is an issue, but I don't want to end it in a kind of, in, in a negative way. I want to, I'm always a positive person, and I think actually we can win. If 70 school teenagers from Drum Chapel could take on the Home Office and win, as we've been described as, then anybody can do anything. We can achieve anything as long as we're united and we stand shoulder to shoulder. Because the thing with our campaign is that people from all walks of life came together. You know, people from different religions and none, from different races. Our, you know, the community. I mean, Noreen and Jean, absolutely love them. They're, they're my other heroes. I've got too many heroes. Um, they're absolutely amazing. They lived in the block of flats. They're basically grannies, right? They lived in the same block of flats, but they actually go up five in the morning every single day to look out for the vans. And if they saw the vans coming, they would text every asylum seeker in the block to get them out. <laughs> who does that these days? You know, who does that? And it's amazing. It's people like her, it's people like Margaret, you know, Mr. Garvin, and all the people that came together to, to kind of say, you know what, we're not putting up with this. And that's so it should be. But I think as, you know, as social workers and everything, I, I was speaking at, um, at uh, Sterling University earlier this year. And one of the questions was actually one of the most difficult questions I was asked. One of the young uh, women said to me, as a, as a professional, when I come to, you know, if I do come into a, a situation where I am dealing with a family, and I, you know, what do I do? You know, and, and uh, part of me was like, okay, how do I answer this? Part of me felt, half of me was like, well, obviously you stand up for what's right, you do. But then part of me was like, you can't take on the home office. 
You can't, and that's the fact. That's the but. Alone, you can't. Together, you can. You can form groups. You can, you know, join campaigns that are ongoing, and you can do it that way. There are different ways to do it. But I honestly, I believe I have so much faith in humanity, and I, and I think, you know, what we, what's going through right now, it's it's the whole kind of fear. But I genuinely believe that actually hope is much stronger than fear. And as long as we stay united, we can never be defeated. Thank you.